Hello and welcome. Uh, I am Zach, your uh, chill companion through the uh, world of leftist literature, and I'm bringing you another edition of uh, Bread Theory tonight, where we are going to be listening to the audiobook of Chapter 3 of The Conquest of Bread uh, by Peter Kropotkin. So we're going to be uh, discussing the ideas that, that are brought up in it and applying it to the modern day. Well, uh, I guess let's let's uh, get right into the book. We're going to be playing uh, SimCity, the, the 2013 version again, uh, as we have in past weeks. Um, just to give you something to look at while we uh, try and concentrate on these uh, ideas. So let's get right into the audio for tonight for The Conquest of Bread. Chapter 3 of The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Conquest of Bread Chapter 3 Anarchist Communism Every society, on abolishing private property, will be forced, we maintain, to organize itself on the lines of communist anarchy. Anarchy leads to communism and communism to anarchy, both alike being expressions of the predominant tendency in modern societies, the pursuit of equality. Time was when a peasant family could consider the corn it sowed and reaped, or the woollen garments woven in the cottage, as the products of its own toil. But even then, this way of looking at things was not quite correct. There were the roads and the bridges made in common, the swamps drained by common toil, the communal pastures enclosed by hedges, which were kept in repair by each and all. If the looms for weaving or the dyes for colouring the fabrics were improved by somebody, all profited. And even in those days, a peasant family could not live alone, but was dependent in a thousand ways on the village or the commune. But nowadays, in the present state of industry, when everything is interdependent, when every branch of production is knit up with all the rest, the attempt to claim an individualist origin for the products of industry is absolutely untenable. The astonishing perfection attained by the textile or mining industries in civilized countries is due to the simultaneous development of a thousand other industries, great and small, to the extension of the railroad system, to inter-oceanic navigation, to the manual skill of thousands of workers, to a certain standard of culture reached by the working classes as a whole, to the labourers, in short, of men in every corner of the globe. The Italians who died of cholera while making the Suez Canal, or of ankyolysis in the St. Gothard Tunnel, and the Americans mowed down by shot and shell while fighting for the abolition of slavery, have helped to develop the cotton industry in France and England, as well as the work girls who languished in the factories of Manchester and Rouen, and the inventor who, following the suggestion of some workers, succeeds in improving the looms. How, then, shall we estimate the share of each in the riches which all contribute to a mass? So basically, uh, what Kropotkin is trying to lay out here is the his uh, basic assertion, I should say, is that because there's so many hands that have touched any given product or have worked on any given service, um, from the people that, you know, make the tools that are used in the process to the people that uh, refine the, the energy, uh, the coal or whatever it was, um, to produce it, to, you know, on and on up the chain. It, it, things are just such a tangled mess of, of labor and collaboration uh, that it's impossible to completely disentangle it and say, well, you are worth this much. Your, your contribution here is worth that much. Um, I, I get what he's saying. Uh, it, it's kind of a, a, in contrast to uh, what, what Marx would call the labor theory of value, where um, however much the, the product was sold for at the end, the profits then get divvied up to the workers based on, on how much uh, each one of them contributed, like how many hours they worked. Um, or based, it could be weighted differently based on how difficult their job was. There, there's a bunch of other ways of looking at the, the 
the way that you calculate how much each person is worth. But as, as we're going to see as we go on here, overall what Kropotkin is saying is, is basically we need to divorce the idea of somebody's worth from what value they create. So just because someone doesn't do uh, as much as another person, as, as long as they're making an effort and, and contributing what they can, then they should be compensated with all the necessities of life um, to kind of uh, help them not struggle against uh, basic survival and, and get up to higher tiers of, of need and kind of live their, their highest and, and best life. And as an end goal, that this is what most communists will talk about too, is the end goal is, is having a completely uh, cashless, moneyless society where, uh, you know, you've, you've probably heard the concept from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. So it's just a need-based economy where things are distributed based on need rather than, you know, I, I own this, so I get this much of it and, and my worker gets that much because, well, that's the deal that I've struck with them or, or that sort of thing. It's a, it's a completely different system. So when it comes down to it, communists and anarchists are looking for the same sort of end goal. It's just a matter of how you get there. Um, anarchy favors much more spread out, kind of uh, horizontally or organized uh, systems of power. Whereas communists believe more that power has to be concentrated because you have to have a strong force against counter-revolutionaries from within and imperialists from without, people coming in to uh, take whatever you have for themselves, basically. So that's important to keep in mind when you see all this leftist squabbling about this system is better, that system is better, oh, you people are naive, you people are just too, you know caught up in your theories and whatever you don't actually do anything and stuff like that when it comes down to it we're all looking for the same sort of uh end state it's just a matter of how you get there um and you know how fast it goes basically so uh so yeah let, let's continue on here looking at production from this general synthetic point of view we cannot hold with the collectivists that payment proportionate to the hours of labor rendered by each would be an ideal arrangement, or even a step in the right direction. Without discussing whether exchange value of goods is really measured in existing societies by the amount of work necessary to produce it, according to the teaching of Adam Smith and Ricardo, in whose footsteps Marx has followed. Suffice it to say here, leaving ourselves free to return to the subject later, that the collectivist ideal appears to us untenable in a society which considers the instruments of labour as a common inheritance. Starting from this principle, such a society would find itself forced from the very outset to abandon all forms of wages. The mitigated individualism of the collectivist system certainly cannot maintain itself alongside a partial communism, the socialization of land and the instruments of production. A new form of property requires a new form of remuneration. A new method of production cannot exist side by side with the old forms of consumption, any more than it can adapt itself to the old forms of political organization. So basically his, his thesis is, you know, it's, it's kind of got to be all or nothing. There's no half measure. You can't have, you know, a, a new, completely new system of compensating people without a, a completely new system of valuing uh, goods and services, and in this case, the value is based on need rather than um, market price or demand or anything. So he's, he's saying you can't. There's no hybrid system. You can't have a mixed economy. Really, it doesn't. It ends up not functioning. That's that's his theory. I I tend to just disagree with that. I think there's a long way that we can go before we get to um, the end state that he's talking about. You know, we can we can have market socialism. I don't think that's a contradiction in terms. We can have uh, a system where basic human needs, um, those being food, water, shelter, communication, uh, transportation, access to education and community, healthcare, things like that are decommodified and provided by uh, taxes if need be, or just by people sharing in, in mutual aid projects with each other 
uh, more ideally, or, or a combination of both really. Um, and then we can get a long way towards his end goal, but still keep some things in the, the free market. Um, things like luxury goods, things that, that aren't, aren't necessarily something that people need to survive or, or thrive, uh, and, and stuff like that. And, um, I think that's, that's still a worthy step to take. I think it's still a possible step. It doesn't have to be an end goal, but, uh, just going from <laughs> going, going to a completely different system all at once, it's going to be difficult for, for a number of reasons. I mean, you have to convince a lot of people all at once that your idea is the best and without at least a majority of the population on board with you, I don't really see how that's going to happen. Uh, you're going to have people, people just, uh, they resist change just as a, as a knee jerk reflex, you know, even if they haven't thought about it at all. I mean, take for a small example, the, the stupid Mr. Potato Head controversy recently where they've taken the Mr. off Mr. Potato Head. And what happens with these reactionaries just fly into a rage? Oh, you're, you're making them a potato, uh, non-binary or, or, or trans or whatever scare word for them is. Uh, it's just ridiculous. No one's actually thinking about it. No one's think, thinking well, this is just a plastic toy. Why does it need to have a gender? What, what's the big deal? It's just because it's something different and people react. There's no real thought involved. And that's a small, completely inconse inconsequential example. So imagine instead of taking the Mr. Off Mr. Potato Head, we're like, we're doing away with money. We're doing away with, with uh, even the labor theory of value. We're going to do away with all forms of uh compensation or all forms of, of monetary compensation instead we're going to go to a, a needs-based system uh and we're going to completely do away with all um business hierarchies we get rid of the old authoritarian system and it's, it's all going to be horizontally structured if this happened all at once uh, people would be losing their minds uh because that's, that would be completely upending everything that they've, they've known their entire life. Uh, most people have not even been exposed to these sorts of ideas. There's a, there's a whole big industry uh, and, and government system all put in place to, to work against any people even understanding these ideas correctly. I mean, think about when you, you went through school. I know for me personally, uh, we would read books like 1984 and uh, especially ones like Animal Farm. And, you know, the, t the, the takeaway would always be, oh, look what happens. These are good intentions, or in the case of 1904, not necessarily good intentions at all, but just the, the slow creep of authoritarianism. And uh, so we better, you know, feel uh, grateful that we have the system that we do, because look at, look at any other system, is it, any other system at all. It's just chaos and, and authoritarianism. Or not, I'm sorry, I guess the opposite of chaos, but uh, strict authoritarianism. Um, and so we better not even really think about it. And, you know, I wonder how many of my teachers that I had actually had thought about this or were allowed to freely talk about the possibility of anything other than our current um, governmental and political and our current political and economic systems. Um, Probably not that many had, had either thought about it, and if they had thought about it, were felt free to, to actually explore these ideas. So I, I, I think I probably have an average experience, and if you, you take the entire population of a country like the U.S. and all of a sudden throw something at them that they have no, no basis of mapping onto, well, they're just going to freak out. So, and, that, and that's where the... the uh, authoritarian leftists would come in and say, well, we'll force them to. And if they don't, we'll, we'll send them to re-education camps and not necessarily in a sinister way, just like, hey, you guys got to get caught up to speed on, on these, these new ideas. These are going to be the way of things. If you don't like it, that's just too bad. This is the system that we're imposing on now because it's the right thing to do. Um, but that, I mean, that has its problems too. As, as we've discussed in past streams, when you 
centralized power, even for benevolent ends, you run the risk of uh, either the wrong people seizing power before you do, or you, in some ways, even worse, uh, the wrong people getting power after you're out of the way, like after the charismatic leader is gone uh, and you have their number two, who may be uh, incompetent, they may have different designs, they may just want to make things cushy for themselves and, and you know, kind of go back to a, a more top-down authoritarian form of things. Uh, so where, where, where does that leave you? Um, I mean, in my opinion, I think we have to go slower. I, I think there's only one long-term sustainable way of doing these these sorts of things, and that's to push these ideas to as many people as we can, as fast as we can, in, in ways that are understandable to them and that uh, resonate with their worldview. So if we frame things in terms of democracy and freedom, those are things that I would assume would pull pretty well. How much freedom do you have at work? Not very much. How much democracy is at work? Zero, probably. Probably your boss makes all your decisions and you just kind of have to go with it or go somewhere. That's your only freedom is to try another authoritarian uh, private company. Um, but I think if we, if we start just introducing these ideas in ways that people understand, then little by little we can, we can start at least breaking down that facade that capitalism is the end of history and that uh, all we have to look forward to is, is, is more of the same. And if you're lucky, you get to be one of the few that climbs that corporate ladder and, you know, well, then you got control over other people, but at least it's not you that's, that's being controlled anymore. I think we, I think we can provide an alternative that is uh, compelling, um, that, that, that speaks to people's experiences and, that's that's told to them in a way that's that's not scary and that they can understand. But uh, let's continue on here because we're not that far into it, and I've already been talking a lot. The wage system arises out of the individual ownership of the land and the instruments of labor. It was the necessary condition for the development of capitalist production, and will perish with it in spite of the attempt to disguise it as profit sharing. The common possession of the instruments of labor must necessarily bring with it the enjoyment in common of the fruits of common labour. We hold further that communism is not only desirable, but that existing societies founded on individualism are inevitably impelled in the direction of communism. The development of individualism during the last three centuries is explained by the efforts of the individual to protect himself from the tyranny of capital and of the state. For a time he imagined, and those who expressed his thought for him declared, that he could free himself entirely from the state and from society. By means of money, he said, I can buy all that I need, but the individual was on the wrong track, and modern history has taught him to recognise that. Without the help of all, he can do nothing, although his strong boxes are full of gold. In fact, along with the current of individualism, we find in all modern history a tendency on the one hand to retain all that remains of the partial communism of antiquity, and on the other to establish the communist principle in the thousand developments of modern life. As soon as the communes of the 10th, 11th and 12th centuries had succeeded in emancipating themselves from their lords, ecclesiastical or lay, their communal labour and communal consumption began to extend and develop rapidly. The township, and not private persons, freighted ships and equipped expeditions for the export of their manufacture, and the benefit arising from the foreign trade did not accrue to individuals, but was shared by all. At the outset, the township also brought provisions for all their citizens. Traces of these institutions have lingered on into the 19th century, and the people piously cherish the memory of them in their legends. So again, we hear the... the, the arc of history being told as, as a story from control, absolute power in the hands of, of feudal lords and monarchs, uh, to being slowly wrested away from them, forced out of their hands uh, by groups working together, not by individuals, not just by one person saying, well, screw you guys, I'm going to go live by myself in the woods, but by uh, groups of people working together. 
Um, so I think that's that's another important way of framing things. Is, is that's all we're talking about when we talk about doing away with capitalism, is is continuing on that slow taking of power from the few and and spreading it out to as many people as possible, uh, and that being a good thing. That that producing the most freedom and the most uh, democracy uh, for the most people and the most uh, beneficial outcomes overall. All that has disappeared, but the rural township still struggles to preserve the last traces of this communism, and it succeeds except when the state throws its heavy sword into the balance. Meanwhile, new organizations, based on the same principle, to every man according to his needs, sprung up under a thousand different forms, for without a certain level of communism, the present societies could not exist. In spite of the narrowly egotistic turn given to men's minds by the commercial system, the tendency towards communism is constantly appearing, and it influences our activities in a variety of ways. The bridges, for the use of which a toll was levied in the old days, have become public property and are free to all, and so are the high roads, except in the east, where a toll is still extracted from the traveller for every mile of his journey. Museums, free libraries, free schools, free meals for children, parks and gardens open to all, streets paved and lighted, free to all, water supplied to every house without measure or stint. All such arrangements are founded on the principle, take what you need. So, again, we're, we're getting into the concept of, of all for all, um, and how the, the a lot of the public sphere, the, the, like literally the public, not just... Uh, the public, as in the, the uh, as in uh, citizens, but the public is in public spaces. Uh, a lot of that functions already in the the all for all. That based on your need, take what you need. It's it's all for you. We all do this 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 laboring together and produce goods and services for everybody. You don't have to you don't have to pop a coin into a street light to make it turn on. You don't have to. I mean, there are toll roads. Um, that's an entirely another matter, but uh, by and large, roads are free to, to walk on, to drive on. Um, public squares are free. Public parks, generally free uh, for anyone who wants to use it and enjoy it. There's there's nothing that says you can't go play in a park. Um, of course, now under COVID, there's some restrictions on that, but you know, soon things will go back to how they were. Uh, so yeah, so the, the idea that you may have heard this this idea. Um, I think it was kind of poorly articulated, but it was the the concept that oh, you say you hate socialism, but you like the roads, you like this, you like that. In a certain way, that is a feature of socialism: is is um, having these things like transportation and 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 uh, community and sort of thing provided for by whatever central power there is, whether you know if you call it a government or if it's um, just people getting together to provide things for each other based on the needs they see in a way that is socialism but I think it it, it kind of misses a whole big chunk of, of socialism um, because it doesn't include the part where you know we also have a, you can have all these these services that the government provides and going back to the, the Scandinavian countries especially Sweden that is something that, that they end up doing is, is providing a, a lot of these basic necessities for life. But then on the other hand, you can still have a uh, private enterprise that's exploitative. Even if you have unions, it can, it's still probably exploitative. You still probably have people who are taking at least some of the money they make, not based on how much work they do, but just based on I'm an owner or a higher up. And, and so the owner says that I get to take more uh, rather than any sort of uh, connection between what you actually do for it and, and how you're actually compensated. Um, so, so just saying that the public facilities, well, that's socialism. That's, that's a bit overly simplistic. You really need to have that other component of it too, which is, democratization of the workplace and the decommodification of basic necessities. Um, 
to truly have socialism, you have to do away with things like landlords and private enterprise altogether in, in the idea of uh, one person owning and then having workers that they take work, uh, money from. Instead, you would have all the workers of a company collectively owning it, and you may still have hierarchies based out of need, such as expertise or just having people to organize groups of people to do this or that task, um, you have managers still and that sort of thing, but you don't just have one guy sitting at the top. You have uh, meetings where you decide on things like compensation, day-to-day -day operations, dis uh, distribution of, of labor, um, working conditions, um, even things like pensions, you know, stuff like that, where people democratically make those decisions. And again, day-to-day -day operation, you still might have a boss who says, okay, no, you know, go clean this, go cook this food, whatever, whatever the service is. Um, but they don't then also get to take a whole bunch of compensation from you. And you still get an equal say when it comes down to it in the overall running of the company, even if the mind you show that the day-to-day -day details are not controlled directly by you. So yeah, again, you can't really have one without, an, without the other and call it socialism altogether. Uh, let alone something that, that's as far along as, as some sort of truer anarchy or communism. The tramways and railways have already introduced monthly and annual season tickets, without limiting the number of journeys taken. And two nations, Hungary and Russia, have introduced on their railways the zone system, which permits the holder to travel 500 or 800 miles for the same price. It is but a short step from that to a uniform charge, such as already prevails in the postal service. In all these innovations, and in a thousand others, the tendency is not to measure the individual consumption. One man wants to travel 800 miles, another 500. These are personal requirements. There is no sufficient reason why one should pay twice as much as the other, because his need is twice as great. Just a little aside on that. Uh, as I get this channel going, I am going to be putting out more of my own ideas. Like last week, I talked about my idea for stone soup socialism. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to either do a different streaming day, uh, cause I don't want to disrupt the flow of getting these chapters out or if I'm just going to wait till the end of this book and then, and have some time in between the next book where I, I lay out an idea or two of mine, but one of them, probably the next one that I'm going to cover in, in depth is going to be, uh, my concept for how to plan and uh, implement uh, uh, a mass transit system of the future, one that could work for a city. I'm going to use my, uh, the metro area of the Twin Cities. That's where I live. That's what I know the best. Um, and I plan on laying out how it could function under our current system but and possibly generate power, uh, generate tax base, because that is the system we live under right now, um, and uh reduce the the maintenance costs of the roads and bridges all of them coming to to uh save such a amount of money and generate such an amount of money as to potentially not even needing fares anymore where we would have mass transit coming to uh, the point where it is one of those decommodified systems and one that's even entirely provided for by uh, the efforts of everyone through their tax dollars and also through um, some of the other uh, mechanisms that I'll be talking about. So that's, I just want to tease that little idea before uh, I forgot it. Um, so be looking for that. I'll, I'll announce if I do a different stream day. Um, at the end of this, this stream, I'll, I'll put up my links where you'll be able to uh, keep on the lookout for that sort of thing. Such are the signs which appear even now in our individualist societies. Moreover, there is a tendency, though still a feeble one, to consider the needs of the individual, irrespective of his past or possible services to the community. We are beginning to think of society as a whole, each part of which is so intimately bound up with the others that a service rendered to one is a service rendered to all. When you go into a public library, not indeed the National Library of Paris, but say, into the British Museum, or the Berlin Library. The librarian does not ask what services you have rendered to society before giving you the book, or the 50 books which you require. 
He even comes to your assistance if you do not know how to manage the catalogue. By means of uniform credentials, and very often a contribution of work is preferred. The scientific society opens its museums, its gardens, its libraries, its laboratories, and its annual conversations to each of its members, whether he be... So here we are. Uh, educational systems that are provided based on need rather than on any sort of worthiness, any sort of ability to pay. Uh, why is it? Why is that just taken for granted in our society? Well, uh, at least in the U.S., free higher education is is scoffed at. Is is oh, it's completely uh, unattainable. It costs too much money to uh, do away with that. They're not that different of concepts. The only question is is potentially a difference in scale. But uh, as I've mentioned often, we're the we are the richest society, we're the richest country in, in human history. And these are things we say we can't afford when other countries do. So we've already decommodified a part of education. Why not just keep going? You know, let's let's keep pushing that issue of freedom. And and how free are you when you're a college student who is saddled by tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, or in the case of, say, a med student, uh, over a million dollars in, in student loan debts. How free are you to live your life? What if you decide you don't want to be a med, uh, medical professional after that? You are locked in until that stuff is paid off, and there's not going to be a, a better avenue for uh, getting that compensation back. So how much freedom is our education system even offering us at this point? Wouldn't it be a lot more freeing if, if we didn't have that huge debt burden settled on uh, all, the, all of the people that come through the system? And uh, I've heard the, the theory put forward that one big reason that these, these debt institutions have become so large and uh, that student debt has become such a big thing is uh, to saddle students with debt so that they won't do anything to jeopardize their uh, their future ability to pay it off. So they won't, you know, protest for for things. They won't rabble rouse in any sort of way. They'll just uh, kind of passively accept whatever fate they get, and um, you know, it kind of puts a lid on on well, you know, liberalism really, or the liberalization of of ideas and knowledge because, you know, as, as much as uh, people don't like to admit it uh, or, or like to try and downplay it and saying that institutions of education are, are neutral, having an open mind alone and being exposed to new ideas all the time is towards the left side of the spectrum. Uh, if you're just looking at a, a basic political spectrum. Um, keeping traditions, keeping the old ways, not learning new things, that becomes more conservative. So, uh, capitalism has a big stake in keeping people less progressive than they otherwise might be, because if you get too progressive, well, that eventually you punch through that left wall that I've mentioned before, that left wall of capitalism, and you start advocating for a system that's beyond. Be a Darwin or a simple amateur. At St. Petersburg, if you are elaborating an invention, you go into a special laboratory where you are given a place, a carpenter's bench, a turning lathe, all the necessary tools and scientific instruments, provided only you know how to use them, and you are allowed to work there as long as you please. There are the tools, interest others in your idea, join the fellow workers skilled in various crafts, or work alone if you prefer it. Invent a flying machine, or invent nothing, that is your own affair. You are pursuing an idea that is enough. So we're getting the, the beginnings of, of thinking towards, uh, again, the concept of all for all. Um, and, and, and the beginnings of the ideas of organizing things in a different way, where it's not uh, for profit or for any sort of a, a gain, but uh, people self-organizing, self-organizing themselves based on whatever pursuits they may have, whatever passions they may have in their life. Um, 
and being free to do so because you have all the basics covered for yourself, all the basics of life, so you're not being hamstrung by that or, or shackled in any way. And you don't have the, the barrier to entry uh, into a new field based on even necessarily qualifications. It's just like, you know, you feel a passion like they were talking about for woodworking. You go find a woodworking guild who's, who's doing it. You say, hey, I want to learn woodworking. People say, okay, we'll teach you how to do it. And, and organizing things around people's passions uh, rather than forcing them to this or that sort of uh, career trajectory based on what they can be compensated for, what's going to be enough for them, um, how they can advance furthest in life, that sort of thing. Um, just a different way of, of organizing things. Um, and I think it gets at the rudiments of, of at least my understanding of what syndicalism, you may have heard of anarcho-syndicalism. And that's the idea that people form voluntary organizations of you know whatever craft it is, whatever service it is, and people that have an interest, and then also a willingness to learn or the skill uh, beforehand, just come together, they produce whatever good or service it is, and they distribute it to their local community based on need and uh, general feeling of, of mutual aid, of, of providing all for all, not just, um, yeah, not just doing, th not just providing everything for the few, basically, or most for the few. In the same way, those who man the lifeboat do not ask credentials from the crew of a sinking ship. They launch their boats, risk their lives in the raging waves, and sometimes perish, all to save men whom they do not even know. And what need to know them? They are human beings, and they need our aid. That is enough. That establishes their right to the rescue. Thus we find a tendency, eminently communistic, springing up on all sides and in various guises, in the very heart of theoretical, individualist societies. Suppose that one of our great cities, so egotistic in ordinary times, were visited tomorrow by some calamity, a siege for instance. That same selfish city would decide that the first needs to satisfy were those of the children and the aged, without asking what services they had rendered or were likely to render in society. It would first of all feed them. Then the combatants would be... And so, although Kropotkin is talking about an emergency in the terms of a siege on a city, we can we can think of plenty of modern examples of disasters uh, where society completely breaks down in a localized area. Uh, you don't you don't have the ability. You're, you're all focusing on survival uh, rather than um, any sort of long-term goals like that. And how do people reorganize themselves? Well, they don't just throw the, the old people to, you know, fend for themselves. They don't just, uh, you know, just let your neighbor drown in a flood or whatever. You, you all help each other without first saying, oh, well, you know, let me make sure that you are worthy of this compensation, this, this help that I'm giving to you. Um, I think there's a lot of wisdom to the idea that, that disasters and emergency situations reveal... Uh, people's true character and you look at at uh what happened what tends to happen in these disaster situations people pull together why does it only happen in disaster situations why is this not something that we could apply to our everyday life where we see needs and we try and help fill them as best we can by people banding together um and not everyone is this way either though there are disaster situations uh the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Katrina comes to mind, where you had, uh, let's say, law and order break down to the point where police weren't able to go into certain neighborhoods, and there was enough people left over in these neighborhoods that uh, they kind of had to take matters into their own hands when it comes to, like, um, just defending their own lives. And there was groups of uh, white nationalists who got together in bands and would go around patrolling neighborhoods harassing people in in some accounts actively hunting uh, people of color uh, so disasters can bring out also 
the worst in people. And this, this, this power vacuum can also bring out the worst in some people. But who came to, to, to save those people? Who, who came to turn that situation around and push back those white nationalists? Well, I'll tell you, it was Mutual Aid Disaster Relief, which was an anarchist organization. I, I don't know their entire history, but they, they really came to shine in that moment where they organized the, the people who were being harassed and hunted by these white nationalists. They organized them and they took guns and and made a stand against these people. And there was never any firefight that, I, that I'm aware of from any of the accounts, but just by their presence of saying, we won't let you do this, uh, the worst elements that were left over in that society relented and they backed off. Surprise, surprise, white nationalists, when it comes down to it, are cowards and they will back down from any true show of force. They, they worship and rally around who they believe is strong and any instance where that person, that leader is is shown to be weak or stupid or embarrassed, and they will they will, you know, run away with their tails between their legs. So all it takes is a little bit of pushback. But overall, that society showed that when when it comes down to it, people will act this way. They will they will band together and help fulfill each other's needs without any thought of future compensation, without any thought of the you know lost wages for themselves, or any of these other things. When it comes down to it, people can function in ways where mutual aid is the rule of the day, not some fringe thing that, that some, you know, some hippies get together in the park and, and serve people soup or something like that. Uh, it can go a lot more. But it starts with people believing that it can. Cared for. Irrespective of the courage or the intelligence that each had displayed, and thousands of men and women would outfy each other in unselfish devotion to the wounded. This tendency exists, and it is felt as soon as the most pressing needs of each are satisfied, and in proportion to the productive power of the race increases. It becomes an active force every time a great idea comes to oust the mean preoccupations of everyday life. How can we doubt then? That when the instruments of production are placed at the service of all, when business is conducted on communist principles, when labor, having recovered its place of honor in society, produces much more than is necessary to all, how can we doubt that this force, already so powerful, will enlarge its sphere of action till it becomes the ruling principle of social life? Following these indications, and considering further the practical side of expropriation, of which we shall speak in the following chapters. We are convinced that our first obligation, when the revolution shall have broken the power upholding the present system, will be to realise communism without delay. But ours is neither the communism of Fourier and the Phalansterians, nor of the German state socialists. It is anarchist communism, communism without government, the communists of the free. It is the synthesis of two ideals pursued by humanity throughout the ages. Economic and Political Liberty In taking anarchy for our ideal of political or Just another little side note there. You hear that idea of, of framing it as liberty. And that's not just propaganda or, or spinning talking points or anything like that. It really is talking about human freedom and freeing people up to uh, unburden themselves of everything that's holding them back and to be able to help one another. Uh, there, oh, uh, there was a uh, experiment in Stockton, California recently, where they introduced UBI, which is Universal Bas Basic Income. I don't know if it was the whole city, but it was at least to a group of people. And then they studied them for you know over the course of months. And what they found was that when these people have this just extra little boost, it was only like five hundred dollars a month, which you know, to someone not making more than minimum wage, that's a lot. But to someone who uh, is making six figures that might be, you know, that's basically a pittance. That's, that's, you know, you can lose that money on your way to work. Uh, but just that little bit, they found that the people became more employed. Uh, more of them got full-time jobs. They, they moved up from, from part-time to full-time or they moved up from no job to having jobs. They, uh, had all these different measures by all these different measures, their lives improved just by being given money. 
And in essence, that's the sort of society we're talking about is rather than necessarily just compensating people monetarily, we just give people houses. We build them together and then we give them to people. We, instead of, uh, you know, giving people an EBT card where they can go purchase food, we just give people food. We grow it. We say, hey, you need food. Here's some food. It's, it's, it's these radically simple ideas. But, you know, I, I, I believe the results would be similar to what happened in Stockton only many times over. You would have people that, that, that are not being driven into the ground and ground down by, by constant debt and constant worries about finances, constant insecurity that leads to medical problems, that leads to mental health problems, that leads to all sorts of problems. It's really expensive. It's really costly to a person to be poor and not just in terms of dollars and cents, but everything, everything is, is ground down by being poor and never having enough. So lifting all that bottom up all at once, just think of how many people could be empowered and how many people after they were empowered uh, would go on to help others and, and they would go on to help even more. I mean, think of it. I think if you call it, it came into some big windfall in, in your life and you were suddenly free to do anything, wouldn't you like want to spread that around, help your friends out, help your family out, help people on the street out? You know, if you had the ability to, wouldn't you want to do good in the world? I know that I would. There's, I know exactly what I would do if I had millions of extra dollars and it would be things like start cooperative businesses and help spread messages like the one that I'm trying to spread, help other leftist creators get off the ground, things like that. Let's imagine that as a society together, and then let's work towards it. Organization. We are only given expression to another marked tendency of human progress. Whenever European societies have developed up to a certain point, they have shaken off the yoke of authority and substituted a system founded more or less on the principles of individual liberty. And history shows us that these periods of partial or general revolution, when the old governments were overthrown, were also periods of sudden progress in both the economic and the intellectual field. So it was after the enfranchisement of the communes, whose monuments, produced by the free labour of the guilds, have never been surpassed. So it was after the great peasant uprising which brought about the Reformation and imperiled the papacy. And so it was again with the society, free for a brief space, which was created on the other side of the Atlantic, by the malcontents from the old world. And, if we observe the present development of civilized nations, we see, most unmistakably, a movement ever more and more marked tending to limit the sphere of action of the government, and to allow more and more liberty to the individual. This evolution is going on before our eyes, though cumbered by the ruins and rubbish of old institutions. And again, Kropotkin is convinced that this can happen all at once, where we go from government providing these things to uh, all of a sudden all of us is providing for us all and theoretically in a revolution that that sort of thing could happen but for one thing we're the, the size of the, the government is, is so large at this point that it's 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 nearly impossible to conceive of any I mean it's nearly impossible to conceive of any successful revolution against them. The, the military is the largest in human history and many times larger than any uh, of the next like 20 countries combined. There's, there's not really the means to, to perform any sort of violent revolution anymore. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't still make changes and we can't still build towards a different kind of revolution. Um, and I, you know, like I say, I, I believe we can get to these sorts of ideals uh, just by a, a you know, starting out smaller and taking a, a, a different path than Kropotkin advocates for. Uh, he, he seems to think revolutions are inevitable in some way. Perhaps they are. Um, if there was ever a point where uh, world governments were weakened by something so much like, oh, like oh, I guess, I, I suppose, almost what COVID did to the world, if there was ever some point where governments were brought to the knees, perhaps then, but you know, that's kind of, that's a big what if, you know, instead I like to do, I, I would personally like to just, uh, 
orient ourselves towards what we can do now with what, what means we have now and just kind of move, move along towards that direction uh, the best we can. Um, let's Evolutions and old superstitions. Like all evolutions, it only awaits a revolution to overthrow the old obstacles which block the way, that it may find a free scope in a regenerated society. After having striven long in vain to solve the insoluble problem, the problem of constructing a government which will not constrain the individual to obedience without itself ceasing to be the servant of society, men at last attempt to free themselves from every form of government and to satisfy their need for organisation by free contracts between individuals and groups pursuing the same aim. The independence of each small territorial unit becomes a pressing need. Mutual agreement replaces law in order to regulate individual interests in view of a common object, very often disregarding the frontiers of the present states. All that was once looked on as a function of the government is today called in question. Things are arranged more easily and more satisfactory without the intervention of the state. And in studying the progress made in this direction, we are led to conclude that the tendency of the human race is to reduce government interference to zero. In fact, to abolish the state, the personification of injustice, oppression, and monopoly. One, one minor point of contention with, with that, uh, with constituting the government in that way, is that basically any time you have rules, even if it's within a family, um, say you have a bedtime, well, you know what? That makes your parent the government in, in that sort of relationship. Any sort of relationships you have, Government's naturally going to arise. There's going to be uh, distribution of labor. There's going to be uh, um, some people having, uh, I, I, I don't know. The idea of just completely doing away with all sorts of government doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. There's still going to be decisions that have to be made so that people can get along uh, with each other, neighbors can get along. You know, even if it's something as simple as, you know, you have a, a, a neighborhood council and all of you vote on how your neighborhood should be run, something like that. Um, so, he, well, I can understand what he's saying with it, doing away with government. He's thinking of government as, as this, this third party other. But if everyone is participating, then everyone is the government. If everyone's voting on on what to do about any given um, disagreement or, or method of, of going forward with your community, then everyone is still part of the government. So it's just different ways. It's, it's a slippery term, government. It, it can mean a lot of different things. And uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that for now. We can already catch glimpses of a world in which the bonds which bind the individual are no longer laws, but social habits, the result of the need felt by each of us to seek the support, the cooperation, the sympathy of his neighbours. Assuredly, the idea of a society without a state will give rise to at least as many objections as the political economy of society without private capital. We have all been brought up from our childhood to regard the state as a sort of providence. All our education... The Roman history we learned at school, the Byzantine Code which we studied later under the name of Roman Law, and the various sciences taught at the universities, accustom us to believe in government and in the virtues of state providential. To maintain this superstition, whole systems of philosophy have been elaborated and taught. All politics are based on this principle, and each politician, whatever his colours, comes forward and says to the people, Give my party the power. We can and we will free you from your miseries, which press so heavily upon you. From the cradle to the grave, all our actions are guided by this principle. Open any book on sociology or jurisprudence, and you will find there the government, its organisation, its acts, filling so large a place that we come to believe that there is nothing outside the government and the world of statesmen. So yeah, basically what he's speaking out against is reformism as a means to achieve Anarchy, uh, in this case, an anarcho-communist state or state of being, not not state as in government. Uh, and he's got a point. Like you know, 
every every election that comes up in this country, a lot of promises made. People half believe them, maybe more out of want to believe them. Um, and then the, whoever gets in power, uh, it kind of seems like things don't always get a lot better or better at all in some cases. So he's got a point about electoralism, but uh, there's also... So, so his, his idea is just do away with it all. Skip all the stuff. Let's do it with electoralism and electorally improving our lives. Let's just do this, this anarcho-communism thing together uh, once the opportunity presents itself. But I think there is something still to be said for electoralism. Uh, definitely at the local level, you can still do things like help pass ordinances that give you protections as a tenant. Um, uh, you can help shape your city's, uh, uh, what do I want to say, comprehensive plan. That, for those of you that are not as, as aware of, of city planning as, as I am, uh, all of the ordinances in your city, at least if you're in the United States, all the ordinances of your city have to tie in some way back to your comprehensive plan. This is the, the kind of the uh, guiding document that your city puts out. They do a small one every five years, most likely, and then a large one planning for the next 20 years. Uh, they'll, they'll put that out every 10 years to plan for the next 20. And they, so they'll modify it every five to 10 years. Uh, and every ordinance then that is passed by your city council um, has to in some way say this is based on our goal of uh, let's say it's uh, reducing traffic accidents they, they'll say this ordinance about on-street parking um, at this time of day or that time of day ties into our goal of, of reducing traffic accidents and improving public safety that sort of thing so this is a powerful document you can be a part of the uh, the citizen input you can become a city council person or sit on a board. A lot of these boards don't have a lot of competition, even in a large city. Um, even if it's something like uh, the planning commission, you can be the citizen body that reviews uh, reviews the usually planning development or development plans before they, they go into effect. You can have a say in your, your local government and a meaningful say. Uh, and make people's lives better and push, keep on pushing towards more power uh, distribution and, and more of a foundation for all people. Uh, things like housing ordinances, you can, you can push for more public housing. That's a meaningful change. So to say that electoralism is completely hopeless, I think is an overreach. I think that, uh, you end up falling into the trap of just waiting for the revolution to come so that things can happen for you rather than going out there and doing what you can to, to make things happen now. And everyone can have a part to play. It doesn't all have to be on the ground stuff. It can be stuff like this, uh, communicating with people, helping get the gears turning in people's minds, helping them think of ideas they may have never thought of before. That can be part of a small and slow revolution. Um, so yeah. I would say don't give them get don't give up on electoralism. Don't just wait for things to happen. Do what you can by any means that you have available to you. Um, within and without a government, you know, help your neighbors out. Uh, let's do this. Don't do socialism like I, I brought up in the last stream. Things like that. We can we can do it all. It doesn't all have to be one. The press teaches us the same in every conceivable way. Whole columns are devoted to parliamentary debates and to political intrigues, while the vast everyday life of a nation appears only in the columns given to economic subjects, or in the pages devoted to reports of police and law cases. And when you read the newspapers, you hardly think of the incalculable numbers of beings, all humanity, so to say, who grow up and die, who know sorrow, who work and consume, think and create outside the few encumbering personages who have been so magnified that humanity is hidden by their shadows, enlarged by our ignorance. And yet, as soon as we pass from printed matter to life itself, as soon as we throw a glance at society, we are struck by this infinitesimal part played by other governments. 
And that is something that we, we live in an age now where that doesn't have to be. Through this medium, through YouTube, through any number of social media platforms, we can elevate together the voices that we care about most, even if they never would have gotten the time of day uh, in the past through the print media or, or whatever you know gatekeeping organization for the flow of information there was. We live in a time now where we can get this information out. Uh, so that is also a difference that, that or an advantage that Kapakin didn't have. It was a lot harder in his time for these sorts of ideas to be disseminated. Uh, but we don't have to be limited by that anymore. And we shouldn't. We should, we should continue to boost each other. We should continue to uh, tell each other about um, all these, these sorts of ideas that are floating around. And, and you know, just keep moving that, that flow of information. Bolzak already remarked how millions of peasants spend the whole of their lives without knowing anything about the state, save the heavy taxes they are compelled to pay. Every day, millions of transactions are made without government intervention, and the greatest of them, those of commerce and of the exchange, are carried on in such a way that the government could not be appealed to if one of the contracting parties had the intention of not fulfilling his agreement. Should you speak to a man who understands commerce, he will tell you that the everyday business transacted by merchants would be absolutely impossible were it not based on mutual confidence. The habit of keeping his word, the desire not to lose his credit, amply suffice to maintain this relative honesty. The man who does not feel the slightest remorse when poisoning his customers with noxious drugs covered with pompous labels thinks he is in honour bound to keep his engagements. But if this relative morality has developed under present conditions, when enrichment is the only incentive and the only aim, can we doubt its rapid progress when appropriation of the fruits of others' labour will no longer be the basis of society? Another striking fact, which especially characterises our generation, speaks still more in favour of our ideas. It is the continual extension of the field of enterprise due to private initiative and the prodigious development of free organizations of all kinds. We shall discuss this more at length in the chapter devoted to free agreement. Suffice it to mention that the facts are so numerous and so customary that they are the essence of the second half of the 19th century, even though political and socialist writers ignore them, always preferring to talk to us about the functions of the government. These organizations, free and infinitely varied, are so natural an outcome of our civilization they expand so rapidly and federate with so much ease, they are so necessary a result of continual growth of the needs of civilized man. And lastly, they so advantageously replace governmental interference, that we must recognize in them a factor of growing importance in the life of societies. If they do not yet spread over the whole world of the manifestation of life, it is that they find an insurmountable obstacle in the poverty of the worker, in the divisions of present society, in the private appropriation of capital and in the state. Abolish these obstacles, and you will see them covering the immense field of civilized man's activity. The history of the last 50 years furnishes a living proof that representative government is impotent to discharge all the functions we have sought to assign to it. In days to come, the 19th century will be quoted as having witnessed the failure of parliamentarianism. This impotence is becoming so evident to all, the faults of parliamentarianism and the inherent vices of the representative principle are so self-evident that the few thinkers who have made a... I'd like to say, even though that is still a charge that's levied against electoralism and parliamentarism, uh, since Kropotkin's time, there's been huge leaps forward through um, electoralism, but also... Uh, in some ways, in spite of it, because of uh, pressure from uh, unions and other labor organizations to push things forward. So you look at any, any sort of civil rights movement, it always starts out by outside of government organizations, but eventually they can push the government to change. They can push for um, legalizing people's right to vote, uh, whatever it may be. Um, so uh, again, I don't think we need to give up entirely on electoralism as a concept. I think there's there's still a role for it to play. Uh, 
even if it doesn't push us across that finish line into something outside of capitalism, I think it's still worth pursuing just to get us further along than we're at now. Critical study of them did but give literary form to the popular dissatisfaction. It is not difficult, indeed, to see the absurdity of naming a few men and saying to them, make laws regulating all our spheres of activity, although not one of you knows anything about them. We are beginning to see that government by majorities means abandoning all the affairs of the country to the tidewaiters who make up the majorities in the House and in the election committees, to those, in a word, who have no opinion of their own. Mankind is seeking and already finding new issues. The International Postal Union, the Railway Unions, and the Learned Societies give us examples of solutions based on free agreement in place instead of law. Today, when groups scattered far and wide wish to organise themselves for some object or other, they no longer elect an international parliament of jack of all trades. They proceed in a different way, where it is not possible to meet directly or come to an agreement by correspondence, delegates first in the question that issues are sent, and they are told, endeavour to come to an agreement on such or such question, and then return not with a law in your pocket, but with a proposition of agreement which we may or may not accept. Such is the method of the great industrial companies, the learned societies and numerous associations of every description, which already cover Europe and the United States. And such will be the method of a free society. A society funded on serfdom is in keeping with absolute monarchy. A society based on the wage system and the exploitation of the masses by the capitalists finds its political expression in parliamentarianism. But a free society, regaining possession of the common inheritance, must seek, in free groups and free federations of groups, a new organisation, in harmony with the new economic phase of history. Every economic phase has a political phase corresponding to it, and it would be impossible to touch private property unless a new mode of political life be found at the same time. End of chapter 3 The Conquest of Bread by Peter Kropotkin Read by members of Audible Anarchist. There you have it. That is the end of chapter three. Uh, we talking again ideas about uh, just keeping on with this idea of all for all, and and now adding to that even more, um, trying to separate the idea of how people are compensated in society um, based on uh, their worth as society puts it, but rather making it based on their need. So people are compensated by need rather than um, any other sort of, of measurement, um, whether how productive they are, how productive they're not, uh, for a number of different reasons, because as Kropotkin says, it's hard to disentangle all the different hands that touch any single good or service and compensate people fairly all the way along the chain, and then even looking back even further along the whole scope of history, how many generations have all uh, contributed to getting us to where we're at now, where we can even produce whatever good or service it is, all the knowledge, all the materials, all the just the, the building up. Because it's it's come from all, it, it should go back to all in the present day too. It is, the, it is our collective wealth that is allowing these things, and so it should be our collective wealth that we are compensated with just for being alive, just for being part of society, basically. Um, and the idea that this frees people to pursue their highest and best uh, selves and to um, not be encumbered by the various stumbling blocks of debt or, or want or any of the, the maladies brought about by poverty. Um, I think it's powerful stuff. And while it's still maybe difficult to, to see how we're ever going to get to this sort of society, especially considering all the complexity that's been uh, arrayed since Kropotkin's time, I think it's still worth looking at as a destination. I think it's still something that, you know, we can, we can experiment with, we can, we can try again and again. And, over the long course of history, uh, we can get a whole lot closer to it. Even if it comes out some way, somewhat differently, I think it's still a worthy destination to, to keep in our sights. 
Um, and I think it's something that we can do avoiding the pitfalls of history through things like studying this sort of literature. So, so yeah, uh, I'm still enjoying this book very much. I hope you are as well. Um, so before I send you off to another streamer, go ahead and stop the game for now. And we will pick that up next week. And I'm going to move over to uh, some of my closing links and that sort of thing. So there we go. So if you like this sort of thing, please hit the follow button on Twitch. Uh, that, that helps me build my audience. And the more people that are regularly tuning in, the more people that I get following me, the more people that comment and, and interact in a given stream, uh, the more I can, the closer I can come to making this a real source of income. You know, ideally at some point I'd like to do this as yeah, at least a part-time job where, you know, a few nights a week we're meeting and talking about these cool things. And the more you help me out with that, the, the faster we'll get through these books because the more time I'll have to devote to, uh, you know, just doing this sort of stuff. You know, it takes a long time to edit and, and get these videos out. And right now I have to have a, a, a full-time job outside of that to, to make it all work. But it's uh, it's my labor of love right now. It's, it's something I love doing, but I would love doing it even more if it could be something that, that helps sustain me as well. So if you find this valuable, tell your friends about it um, and you can share any of my links uh, with them. So if you just go to Linktree, I believe it's visible up there, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash bread underscore theory. It will pull up all my different links to Twitch, to YouTube, to my podcast, which I've, I've put out recently, um, my Facebook groups, my Twitter, all, all the sort of ways that you can, can reach me and be a part of, of the projects that I'm doing. Um, the more you share, the more, you know, it, it's, it's all greatly appreciated. Um, all right, so then one last thing before we go, I would like to do my boost of the week and where I like to feature some different leftist creators in different forms that I think are doing really wonderful things that I think you all should check out. So my first one for this week is Mike from PA and Mike is, is, uh, also known as Central Committee. You may have seen him come up that way too, uh, but he is... First and foremost, first and foremost, a Twitch streamer. He usually uh, streams in uh, well early afternoon uh, to or I'm sorry, late morning to early afternoon my time. Um, so that's the that's the central time zone. So you you just have to check his schedule to see when he's streaming based on where you live. But uh, he's a really intelligent guy. He uh, is a former political candidate from Pennsylvania, which is where. He got his, his his nickname, Mike from PA. He was a frequent caller to the Majority Report, which is another great show that you guys should be following. Uh, and he has a really good grasp of both theory and, and I'd say even more importantly, uh, the levers of power. He really knows um, good political strategy for trying to maximize the effect of, of what we're all trying to accomplish here. So... Uh, definitely go check out Mike from PA. He's on. He's got all his videos on YouTube, and then he streams daily on Twitch too. So check him out. And then my second boost is the podcast, The Revolutionary Left Radio. They also do uh, another uh, podcast called Red Menace, where they um, they they do the same sorts of things. They they go through uh, or same sorts of things that I do. They go through philosophy books. And they kind of analyze them, pick them apart, and apply them to the, the modern day. But Rev Left Radio, uh, it's just a phenomenal show. One of my favorite podcasts out there right now. Uh, Brett is just an amazing interviewer. He, he knows the, the really hard-hitting questions to drill deep into the various issues that he, he talks about. And he seems to know just about everything, or at least a little bit, about virtually every facet of leftism. He, you know, they've talked with people from Redneck Revolt. They've talked with uh, indigenous groups that are working towards uh, socialist um, 
uh, theories and, and practice. He's talked with so many different people and he always has you know, very poignant and hard hitting questions. Uh, I really appreciate his stuff. So you can find both Revolutionary Left, Left Radio and uh, Red Scare um, wherever you find your podcast. They, they're on all the different podcasting platforms. So check them out too. All right. So now we've come to the end of the show. I really appreciate y'all hanging with me through all this. Um, I know I can get off on a, a tangent sometimes, but I really do appreciate you you sticking it out. Uh, so I'm going to send you now to another streamer uh, called Easy Answers. Um, I don't know their pronouns, so I'm not going to I'm not going to try and, and guess on that. But they're uh, really funny. They're currently streaming. Um, you may have heard the, the title Leisure Suit Larry. It's a, it's a comedy game, uh, kind of a point and click adventure. So I'm going to have you go check out them. Give them a follow. Uh, tell them I sent you. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks again so much for hanging out with me. We'll do this again next week. I may be going a little bit earlier next week. I'm, I'm considering pulling it back to 8 o'clock because my mom says she wants to watch the show, but she's in bed by 9 and 9 o'clock Central Time. That's that's the time I, I tend to start streaming. So I'm going to consider pulling it back to 8 o'clock and, and see if um, that works out better for my mom, my mom so she can at least uh, hang out for part of it. So watch my schedule ahead of time. See, I, I'll, I'll make an announcement if I change. But uh, until next week.